Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is Steve Marinucci, uh, freelance writer for Billboard.com, Goldmine, and Access.com, welcoming you to another edition of Things We Said Today, where we get together just about each week to talk about everything happening with the Beatles. Um, uh, let me introduce who's with us. Uh, first, coming from the great state of Maine, um, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something how the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. Our musicologist extraordinaire, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And coming to us from the great state of Connecticut, uh, the host of The Beatles Show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi there, Steve. Hi, everybody. So it's just the three of us this week. Uh, we do not have uh, Al Sussman, who couldn't be with us. But we've got a whole schedule of things to talk about, uh, basically about Sergeant Pepper this week. But we are going to talk about a couple of other things that have happened. Um, Paul McCartney started his tour since the last time we were with you all. Um, the set list has not changed all that much. But uh, you guys want to say – and he also added some U.S. shows. But, uh, you know, I don't know that there's that much to say, especially – I was a little surprised that there weren't more set list changes from the last time. But, um, Alan, you want to – you got anything to say at all? Uh, well, not a lot. I agree with you about the the – slowness with which the set changes um, mm -hmm. uh, from tour to tour. And, and, you know, I guess the surprising thing is we all, you know, we, we all get these things on, you know, everyone's taping these shows and they're up on a track or somewhere on the internet within a day or two of the show. So we can actually follow the tour progress. And a lot of the time people get sound checks at sound checks, he's always mixing it up. He's always playing other stuff that you know. And you would think that well, maybe couldn't he rotate some of these things into the set now and then? You know, right? Um, I, I understand. You know, when you have a catalog like his, where there are so many songs that everybody wants to hear. Okay, but maybe I don't know. I, there's always someone going for the first time and wants to hear "Hey Jude" and "Yesterday," but. An awful lot of people at this point have seen him many times and I think would be happy to hear something different. Um, you know, he, he does a really long show. There's plenty of stuff. But if you've gone, you'd like to hear some new things besides, uh, you know, he added You Won't See Me This Time uh, in Tokyo. I think adding just, you know, one song here and there isn't quite, quite enough. It's, and it's not, you know, it would be more exciting, especially... Even given that everybody is following it um, through the instant bootlegs these days, it would be exciting for that too. You know, people following mm -hmm. things and to go to a show and not know absolutely what the set list is going to be, I think would be fun. That's you know that's mm. something that I've often kind of wondered about with the uh, soundcheck songs is why don't more of them show up? You know, even just occasionally in in the shows, and it's. Uh, you know, I mean, if he goes to that much trouble to put them in the sound check, why not throw them in the shows too? I, I guess they they feel more comfortable just you know doing something that they know is coming rather than you know having the surprise element you know and having things kind of change at the last minute or have something unexpected happen. But it's it's too bad that they don't do that. Ken, what do you think? Oh, I've got a lot of thoughts about this. But first uh -oh. of all, the no, the the sound check, the sound check is to to me, at least I think Paul looks at it as his warm up to the concert. Sometimes, rarely, he'll pluck something out of the sound check and he'll use it in the show. Not often, I'll admit. In fact, quite rarely. And usually if you listen to the sound checks, a lot of that is 50s rock and roll that Paul's real comfortable with. But I do notice that in these four shows, in Tokyo, that he switched around the set list a little bit, which we've talked about here on the show. He has been doing. If you go to two shows in a row, you won't get the exact same set list, but there'll be one or two songs that might be different. For example, actually, if you looked at the Budokan show, the first show, I was actually a bit concerned because it was a shorter program. 
Right. He and, he 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 played it like a like it was a benefit, you know, one of his benefit shows, where yeah. he he really shrinks the set list down, and yeah, I, my first thought too was, uh, I wonder why this is so short, and then he did, you know, and then he boosted it back up for the second show. So, but uh, yeah, that was kind of a that was kind of a little strange that he did that. And maybe it was just to get them started, you know, maybe. They figured with the first show they'd kind of take it easy and then kind of, you know, kind of get warmed up as as it as it was. But yeah, it kind of worried me. I thought maybe this was going to be a pattern. And actually, who would fault Paul if it was? Because I do think that you know, considering how demanding these vocals are for the most part for two and a half to three hours, nobody would fault him if he shortened the show a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it really is very close to his set list from last year. And he did actually do You Won't See Me last year. But what I, I did notice was that he took out Here, There, and Everywhere, which um, was one of the highlights of, of the tour last year for me because Paul actually played it on piano and it gave it a different feel altogether, I think. Um, I also believe that he took out Lovely Rita out of the, the set list. But um, the additions were Sgt. Pepper, and it, it turns out it was the reprise of Sgt. Pepper and I Want to Be Your Man, which he started doing at the desert trip. Mm-hmm. It's not enough of a setless change for me, but then again, you know, I, I have to always think about the fans out there who have never seen him live or who have only seen him a few times and what they would want to see. I don't think anybody on this planet would like him to change his set list and go deeper into his catalog more than I would. But at the same time, you know, if you're going there for the first time, or even if you've seen him a few times, you might feel cheated if he doesn't do Hey Jude and Let It Be and those songs, Live and Let Die, which is such, it's, it still is one of the highlights of seeing him and seeing the big light show and the fireworks go off. He does, there are certain songs that he hasn't changed at all for so long. I'm he'll, 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 he'll never not do live and let, but let, let die. That's you can pretty well guarantee that that will be in the set list forever and ever and ever. You know. Yeah, but what what really surprises me is that ever since he started touring in 2002, he's been doing here today and something as his tributes to John and George, and he hasn't changed them at all. <laughs> You know, I mean, you'd think maybe he'd be a little bit tired. I know that he's very proud of his song here today, as he should be. But there's so many songs you could dedicate to John. You know, I loved when he did that medley in Liverpool, when he did the, uh, you know, the medley mm-hmm. of Beatles songs and, and Give yeah. Me a Chance, you know. Yeah. That was really nice. But you'd think maybe after 16, 17 years of doing the same tribute songs over and over again, He'd want to do something different. I loved it when he was doing All Things Must Pass live. Hmm. But why can't he, you know, change that a, a little bit? He's a creature of habit. Definitely a creature of habit. Anyway. You know, but that anyway. said, there is one interesting footnote about the Japanese tour. Okay, when they arrived in Japan, Nancy was wearing a 1980 Wings Tour of Japan jacket. Mm, I saw and, that. And that, you know, would not be an accident. <laughs> In perfect <laughs> shape, too. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if you saw, uh, there was a QA, there's a QA clip of him that must have been for Japanese TV or some some aspect of the promotion of the tour. And he's reading a bunch of cards with questions on them that theoretically Japanese fans have sent in. And the very first question was, what was that jacket Nancy was wearing? And he kind of copped out. He said, well, it was a, it's a vintage wings jacket from, I think it was sometime in the seventies. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, it, and it seemed odd that he would cop out because they made a, he made a point of having her wear that. And he made a point <laughs> of making that be the first question. Um, maybe, I guess, I guess he figured that people watching it knew exactly what it was and he was tweaking them a little bit, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of an interesting footnote, I think. Yeah. Could I just add one thing here? Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Um, I was very surprised when the American dates were announced and there were 14 all at once. 
Mm. Because, you know, we've been complaining here on this show that everything trickles out, you know, a few dates at a time. Yeah. yeah. And That's here, I mean, I can now plan my vacation <laughs> because <laughs> of the dates, you know, uh, in, in New York and the one in New Jersey. And I'm also quite surprised that he's doing, uh, if you include Syracuse, between New, New Jersey and New York, there's five dates. Hmm. I mean, that's a lot. Are you Usually, going to every one of them? No. Nah, well, I got tickets for Barclays so far. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't know how much you want to talk about the struggle to get tickets during the pre-sale, but uh, my wife and I are furious about the whole scalping problem that we're having right now. But immediately, you know, tickets are, are selling for up to $1,000 on the internet from scalpers who have already bought these pre-sale tickets and it's just disgusting yeah you mm-hmm. know but i feel very fortunate i'm going to go to barclays and i hope uh, I'm, I'm going to shoot for madison square garden too so we'll see and he may i mean he will probably add i wouldn't be surprised if he adds more at some point i really doubt that will be the end I mean, I'm just guessing, but I would I would think that there will be more. I mean, he didn't. He's not coming out this way at all. So, you know, or up this hmm. way. <laughs> oh yeah, or your way either. So yeah, there's there's a number of areas he could he could easily cover. Anyway, let's talk about Sergeant Pepper. Um, Ken went to the listening session in it was in New York City. Ken? Yes, it was. And yeah. We're, where was it? I got to remember the exact place. I could look it up. I don't know it off the top of my well, head. Okay. But um, the it's building, it, it was actually a place where it's known for having a great sound system. Okay. So it was very wisely chosen. Mm-hmm. And um, Giles Martin was there, as was Jeff Jones, the okay. CEO of Apple. And they did a Q&A, as a matter of fact. It was at the, and, world, the world of Macintosh Townhouse. Okay. Thank you, uh, Alan. I can remember the name. So what they basically did was they, they – um, Giles played a few excerpts from um, the alternate takes. Mm-hmm. He played uh, one of the alternate takes of Fixing a Hole, mm-hmm. which I believe was take three. And it was a little bit faster than the one that we've come to know. And um, he also played the mono She's Leaving Home just so that everyone would know and everyone in the audience knew that it was slightly faster. And he played part of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds just to show the mono version had the, the ADT, the double tracking of John's voice, so it gave it more of a spacey feel. And then he also he played the entire new stereo mix for everybody. Okay. And in this room, uh, and you got to imagine, it's, it's a great sound system they have there. I got to sit in the front row by accident mm. and, in the, and in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> now, I should point out, much to everyone's surprise... Elvis Costello was there with us. Mm-hmm. That's what I, yeah. I, heard that. I heard he was there. Yeah, and um, so I got to hear this new stereo mix, and I was totally blown away by it. I mean, I know that it's a phrase that's overused, but it's, it's kind of like you're hearing it for the first time. Hmm. Because I've never heard this album with such clarity before. And when they're doing the process of what we've been talking about here on this show being able to take the original tapes that were used, that were fed into the multi-track mm-hmm. and be able to separate them. And uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen an interview or, or read an interview with Josh Martin where he explained what exactly they did if there was maybe, if maybe they made it into an 8-track or a 16-track recording. Maybe you know. Maybe you guys know. But um, the separation of all the instrumentation was just so clear. And... Um, what I, I'll tell you what really impressed me the most was hearing Fixing a Hole, because I've never heard Paul's voice so amazingly powerful <laughs> as in the very beginning of Fixing a Hole. And also um, the clarity of the Indian instruments and Within You, Without You. You never heard the sitars and the tablas so clear in your whole life. When the drums kick in on Lovely Rita, oh my God, the drums... The drums really benefit, <laughs> most of all, I think, probably, although everything benefits from this new mix. Mm. But um, and A Day in the Life was amazing. You know, it's just the whole just the whole experience of hearing it loud, all the instruments really clear. The guitar solo from Paul and Good Morning, Good Morning was right in your face. You know, it, it was just it was very pronounced. You know, the whole experience blew me away. 
And the thing is, since I've spent most of my life listening to the, to the stereo mix of Sgt. Pepper, more so than the mono, I know that the two of you are, you know, you probably would say you, you should have spent more time with the mono, and I understand the reasoning behind it, and I probably should have spent more time with the mono. I'd like to know. I'm not going to say that, but go ahead. Well, a lot of people feel that way now, because that's the way the Beatles felt. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how they listened to it. And so the question I'd like to ask Giles, if I, or if I get the chance or we get the chance, is, is this really a stereo mix that's closer to the mono sound? Or is it more closer to uh, a mono mix with a little bit of stereo in there? Because, you know, there are moments when the stereo is so obvious, especially in, in A Day in the Life, when you hear Ringo's drums in the right channel. Mm. So, uh, and so clear. So, um, you know, what, what was the balancing act going on between the mono and the stereo there? That's what I'd be most curious about. Well, I think but, it's it's meant to be stereo in the sense of, you know, actual sound stage and placements and things like that. He's just I think what he's saying is that he's guided by the differences between the mono and the stereo and he leaned on the mono. Yeah. Did. The, using the mono characteristics mm-hmm. and doing less of the um you know, extreme panning. That mm-hmm. that you sometimes got in the, in the stereo, even on Pepper. Right. Although, although you know, in Pepper, mostly the vocals are pretty centered. It's not in, not always, but I think that's what what he wanted there. A, 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 yeah, a powerful, punchy sound. Right. Um, in terms of you were asking about the multi tracks, um, it wasn't that Giles what, what Giles did with making a, a multi track. Th- this was done way long ago um in the 90s or even perhaps earlier um they transferred all of the master tapes to multi-track digital and so anything that they had an original four track tape for if it was four tracks it became four tracks on the digital if they found you know when they found the next tape that had new stuff added after the mix downs, they added those new tracks. So, so it wasn't necessarily eight or 16 tracks on, as you know, on digital, there's no real limit. So for right. any song, they just used as many tracks as they had unique instrumental or vocal tracks for, mm-hmm. and then, you know, mixed it from that, which is, you know, which is why it sounds so incredibly clear because everything is first generation now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you definitely notice a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't go, but I saw a, uh, you know, <laughs> we were talking about the internet and Paul McCartney concerts. There actually is a video of Giles's presentation, um, apparently not from the one you were at. Uh, I think there were two showings. Right. Um, I know that the guy who filmed it was not at the one that Elvis Costello went to, but I'm sure that the things Giles did were were pretty similar at both. Um, he played Fixing a Hole, Outtake, on this one, and the, uh, as I'm sure he did at yours, uh, I think takes eight and nine of the vocal ending of A Day in the Life. All right, with the humming. Yeah. Yeah, we got to hear that. Mm-hmm. How did that sound mm-hmm. live in the room? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't too impressed. Yeah. You can tell when, when, when you heard it, it was just... You know, an idea that they tossed around, and and you could tell just from listening to it that that it didn't work. You know, the the interesting thing about that is is that um, this is not the only time when the Beatles did that kind of thing because on the Beatles anthology they tried to do that introduction for eight days a week by doing that humming mm-hmm. chord at the very beginning. Yeah. So you know, I, it took me back to that mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. I think that could have worked if they held the chord the way they did the piano chord, you know, and and on those outtakes that he plays, they just sort of sing the chord and then it stops. And it's just like, oh, that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they apparently had a bunch of people at the, at the session and they could have overdubbed. They could have kept that hum chord going for a really long time if they wanted to. Um, mm-hmm. I guess they hadn't thought of that yet. You know, I think that they somehow came up with the idea of making it a like 40 second chord um, somewhere in between the humming session and the piano session. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I'll tell you one thing, though. Um, 
Jeff Jones, I thought, was really great answering mm-hmm. questions. But yeah. when we talked about, when we first heard about the new deluxe box set, all that it had to offer, and I brought up the whole idea that this might open up the floodgates to, you know, maybe more Beatles albums, mm-hmm. without, without saying specifically <laughs> what their plans are, Jeff Jones said that Apple really does listen to the fans and what is said in social media. And it wouldn't surprise me if they pay attention to podcast shows like this for getting ideas uh, of what to do. Hmm. But I know that Jeff Jeff asked the entire audience, you know, you know what's in the box set. You've been told what's in the box set. Does this make you happy? And everybody, you know, said yes, obviously. Everybody in the audience, they were all big Beatle geeks. And um, so he, it's kind of hinting that this is what's being planned without saying specifically what albums, what would be next. But if this thing shows strong interest, there's no telling what could happen, you know, and I think it's very promising. I don't I really don't think this is a one off. I but that. I still I still would have a, a question mark as to whether they'll go through the whole catalog. I, I think, like I said like I said last time, I think, or when we talked about this originally, I think Abbey Road is a definite candidate. But I don't think I, I can't see them doing it for every single album. I just I just can't. I hope I'm wrong. I mean, I would love to be wrong on this one, but um, I, I really think you know there's a limit to the number of albums that we'll see this with. Hmm. Well, we'll take whatever we can get. But oh, I just think I, that, that, that's without that's without question. But the fact is that that you know CDs aren't selling much in, you know anymore. And although I mean the advance orders on this have been astounding, this has gotten a lot of you know a lot of good reaction. It's it's all anybody is talking about. But uh, I, I really kind of doubt that they will go through and do uh, every single album. I can't see that. Mm. So I could certainly see the White Album being treated like this. There's so many songs on there. You know, you can easily do one CD of outtakes or, or even more. Oh, yeah. You know? there's, no que- there's no question. It's, uh, you know, whether they will go through and, and, and do all of that, you know. And it's also uh, it's also a programming thing, too, as far as the CDs go, you know. Um, you know, they, they're not going to put – they're not going to throw a bunch of random outtakes on a CD and say, here – you know, they want it to sound halfway, halfway decent. So sure. – um, Again, I, I you know I hold that it. it's gonna it's not going to happen with every album. I mean, I would lo- you know I'm sure I would love it to, but I mean, with the Beatles would be another one that would be fun to would be fun to see, uh, or or please please me only because they're both early and because uh, you know the historic nature of the t- of those albums. Um, but well, they're all uh, historic. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, you know, I can't. I can't think of one of their albums where I could not see how a package like this would work. You know, really? You, yeah, you can. You can always make a program that's not just a bunch of random outtakes that is interesting. And I mean, look, we've we've all heard outtakes from all of the albums, right. haven't we? I right. mean, there's good right. stuff. There's good stuff all the way across. And uh, mm-hmm. we got we got to get you hired by Apple, Alan. <laughs> well. Well, you know, there are plenty Jeff of people. Jeff Jones, if you're could, listening, <laughs> I'm not holding my breath, but um, yeah, yeah you know, I, I think it can be done, and and I think that if this sells, uh, we'll we'll see a bit more. I mean, it might start with the White Album or Abbey Road, but um, I think they'll then go back. Whether they're going to do more than one a year, I don't know, and that means that we're stretching out over the next what 14 years or so, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a long time. Well, but, you know that here on this show, I've said many times that Apple has never really cared about the hardcore fan. And now it just seems like, just based on what Jeff Jones is saying, they are listening to what's being said. Mm-hmm. So that's encouraging. Mm-hmm. So, I, wonder um, where, I wonder where the turnabout came from, whether it was, you know, maybe the younger, maybe, you know, Danny and Sean and, you know, some of the younger people finally – you know, kicking in and having their say. I don't know. I wonder, you know, why the change all I of I mean, ma- maybe what it took was it being Pepper, you know? I mean, someone in the company has to have said, look, it's Pepper. You can't just put out another 
reissue of just the album. You have to do mm-hmm. something. And they've been gearing up towards remixing. I mean, we saw it with the Yellow Submarine song track and then the One Plus. You know, there was a long time between those two things, but it's obviously something they've been thinking about. And like the idea of, and they've been testing the waters, and now, you know, now with this, this is sort of the big test of the waters. And if it works mm-hmm. out, I kind of think that, um, you know, the sky's the limit, probably in a way. I mean, I, 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 I like your optimism. I hope you're <laughs> correct. I, it's just, the, it's just so amazing because. You know, all these years you've been hearing how particular the Beatles are and anything going out under their name. And in particular, you know, what I brought up several times about the interview with Paul McCartney in the 80s where he was concerned about different takes of Beatles songs and young fans getting into them would be confused as to what's the real ones and yeah. what's the outtakes and all that. And, you know, I have to imagine that at some point Paul and Ringo must have listened to these outtakes before they went out. Oh, sure. So, they must have approved this, mm-hmm. so they they have to be softening a bit, yeah, for for them to allow this to go out. Well, so, on, on, on the other hand, though, I remember way back when, when the anthology came out, and somebody asked Ringo if there were more outtakes, and he said, "This is it," you know. So, and and we all knew that was that was not true because we had all heard the bootlegs. So something has happened, and uh, you know, thank God for whatever it is. Yeah. We should talk maybe a little a little bit about the tracks that have been sort of dribbling out. iTunes for one thing, uh if you if you pre-order on iTunes which you can only at this point order the 2 CD or I guess mm-hmm. CD doesn't mean anything on iTunes, the 2 disc set. Right. What they give you is the remix of the title track and with a little help from my friends and then the outtakes from disc two of the title track and with a little mm-hmm. help from my friends. Now, those two tracks, the, those two outtakes have been sort of you know, leaked isn't the word they've been given to a number of publications which have put them on the internet. So I think at this point everybody's heard them. And, mm-hmm. you know, and they're interesting. I mean, with a little help from my friends is pre-vocal. And right. you, you hear a lot of detail in there. Uh, and Pepper, I think we've, we've all heard the Pepper outtake. Uh, mm-hmm. And it sounds to me like they've flown in a, a vocal that probably wasn't part of that outtake, but I'm not sure. I um, hope they didn't do that. Yeah. I hope Because the vocal sounds pretty polished to me, but uh, I don't know. Uh, so now we've got four tracks, you know, the first two tracks of the album and then the first two tracks of the alternate album that comes as disc two. And um, on the Record Store Day single, we got the remix of Penny Lane with the 2015 remix of Strawberry Fields. Should we talk about the single? Yes, sure. You know, they they put it out with the original picture sleeve photos, you know, the framed picture mm-hmm. of the Beatles, the Henry Grossman photo on the front, and the pictures of them as kids on the back, just like the old single was. Um, but it's a, a hard cover, uh, rather than the sort of soft sleeve that we used to get. And it's a Parlophone label. And it's Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, except they're both not the mixes that were on the original single. Obviously, they're stereo. Strawberry Fields is the one that we know from One Plus. And Penny Lane is the new one. And it's kind of interesting because when One Plus came out, Penny Lane was one of the tracks that people complained about. I didn't mind it at all. I mean, I loved the clarity of it. I mean, it would, it it sounded completely fresh and new to me. But the problems for people who didn't like it were that it was like way too bright for starters. Mm-hmm. Um, and because it was so clear, it almost seemed in a way as if it wasn't, you know, blended the way you, the way a, a track is when you mix it. It sounds like everything is standing out. I'm not sure what other complaints people had, but um, when I compared the 2017 mix on the single to the 2015 mix from OnePlus, 
I suddenly could see what I couldn't see when people were complaining about it, which is why they were complaining. That said, I mean, it's it's kind of weird to compare a vinyl disc to a CD. Um, and I did a, a transfer of the vinyl onto computer so I could put the two tracks together and just, you know, go back and forth. Um, but, you know, that's not exact. You've got a lot of different things going on in the playback mechanism. Um, mm-hmm. But the single, the new one, the 2017 mix, to me, sounded a lot warmer than the 2015 One Plus mix. Bass is a bit less prominent. I mean, it really comes blasting out on the 2015 mix from, you know, right. the very start. It's definitely prominent i mean it is on the old single too but it's 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 taken down a bit and rounded a bit it's not as bright it has a a kind of you know it's a slightly darker warmer sound on the 2015 mix you hear a lot of those snare hits as if they're you know little explosions and it's it's Mm -hmm. that's toned down a bit on this too this sounds a lot more like the single and the stereo mix on the album track always sounded like as opposed to the sort of ultra spotlit version that we got on the 2015 mix um but gives you yet another mix Um, (laughs) (laughs) would you compare it to the let it be naked to what they did with let it be naked in terms of the sound the way they warm warmed up the, warmed the sound. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't listened to Let It Be Naked in a while, um, but I mean, I, to me, it just sounds a bit more like the normal recording did, mm-hmm. um, but with you know a great deal of clarity, just not a great deal of ultra brightness. You know, that that's did the they, difference. It's the brightness that's. Did different. they use the trumpet ending? No. Hmm. I thought they said they were going to do that. I think there is a take on the six disc set that has the trumpet ending. Um, There is. I think it may even be in mono, actually. I'm looking through that. I have the track list sitting in front of me here, and I'm I'm quickly going through it. Now, the the other thing to say about the single is that um, EMI, in its wisdom, (laughs) pressed up only 7,000 of them for the world. And uh, there were a lot of complaints about that. I mean, I found one up here in Maine, and uh, I was was quite happy. Um, But I know people in New York couldn't find them. And apparently what was going on was people were snapping them up and putting them immediately on eBay. And people got really upset about that, and there was some social media complaints about it. And Giles Martin went on and posted a note saying, yeah, these things are supposed to be for everybody, not for eBay, and I'm going to try to get EMI to press more of them. So, oh, good. Yeah, that so they nice. may turn up in the record stores, you know, as a non-record store day thing, too. But, yeah, they, me, were, they were hard to come by. I'm just looking on the uh, on the track list here, and both the, the 2017 and the 2015, in other words, that single is on the Blu-ray and DVD right. uh, um, discs on the set. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, a thing like this is just a collector's thing. You know, it's if you, right. you want the piece of vinyl, you want the picture cover, you want the the thing. And, you know, and it was fun, i got to say. I mean, I end up driving around, around Maine <laughs> looking for these things. Um, record store day. And uh, there, were, there was a, an additional problem in that um you know the big store chain up here for me is bull moose records which is great i love bull moose records i mean it they've got huge stores full of vinyl full of cds everything i'm sure they i'm sure they love the plug you're giving (laughs) yeah (laughs) well the funny thing is i i went into the one right here in portland and i saw someone i know who works in their uh, administration and i said so you can only buy one of these, huh? And he said, yeah, you can only buy one. And I said, well, okay, I can drive to one of your other stores then if I need another. And he said, a lot of people do. So I then drove to another store and they were out of it and another store and they were out of it. And I finally found a third store that had two more copies. 
Um, so I knew you could buy one at a time. So I brought it up to the counter. I handed them my Bull Moose card, which apparently is required to buy something on Record Store Day. And they said, um, you've already bought this. And I said, yeah, I'm buying it again. And they said, well, you can't. You can only buy one. And I said, well, I just spoke to your chief financial officer, and he told me that, uh, you know, I said, you can go to a different store. And he said, well, a lot of people do that. He didn't say, but when they get there, they're going to be told they can't buy it. Oh, come um, on. <laughs> so I couldn't buy it. And, uh, yeah, so I didn't get didn't get second one I was looking for. But uh, Oh, well. Yeah. Oh, well. Alas. Right. Who knows? Maybe you'll maybe you'll find one eventually. Well, if they print more and put them out, I'll go buy it again. You know. Sure. Sure. You know, I'm not really a collector for these things. I care more about having music that I that I don't have more mm-hmm. than anything. Mm-hmm. But the Penny Lane Strawberry Fields picture sleeve has always been one of my favorites. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. So I would I go for one of those, but I didn't actively. <laughs> but maybe I should. You know, especially yeah. if they're going to make more than the seven thousand. So yeah, That's right. Um, Alan, you also got the. Uh, you were saying you got the McCartney cassette. I did get the McCartney cassette. Um, I didn't listen to that um, because I ran into someone who had listened to it, and he said that it was precisely the same as the downloads, except that it sounded more compressed. And I thought, okay, that's that's not really a a good selling point. So that one I've left. Um, still sealed and uh, you know, put with my McCartney stuff. I now, suppose... I've, I've seen a photo of, of the cassette mm-hmm. and it looks like kind of like the, the handwritten lyrics that Paul puts in his remasters. Mm-hmm. It looks like you have his handwriting there and it looks like he just wrote it kind of the same way, kind mm-hmm. of digitally kind of. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. On the cassette itself, it says, it says handwritten, you know, in parentheses, demos. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. then, the label has uh, you know where there's the date. It's one of Paul's drawings of a like a a, a head smiling. You know, mm-hmm. you know, just one of his quick offhand doodles. Um, on the spine, he's written Paul McCartney and Elvis Costello, and mm-hmm. then on the other side of the, uh, the 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 card label, it lists the three the three songs. I don't want. I don't want to confess. Shallow grave, mistress and maid, and then under it it says in parentheses again demos. So, mm-hmm. how much? How much were they asking for it? Because I didn't. I, I haven't seen one. I don't really know. Oh, I, just, okay. I just went and handed them the card. You know, I mean, oh, okay. I, I, you know, Apple could save me a lot of trouble simply by affixing a hose to my wallet and not having to yeah. think about what things yeah. cost. So, really, <laughs> yeah. really. Uh, I know that the the Penny Lane was something like um, you know seven ninety seven or something like that, and I, I think this was something like that too. Really? Yeah. Okay. I was expecting that to be a lot cheaper, hmm. but oh well, what do I know? But anyway, no, that, it's, kind of, it's kind of cool that Paul is addressing the uh, the cassette as a medium. You yeah. know, and it's well, supposed actually, to be making a comeback. It's supposed. It's actually to. like an. It's actually almost an artsy thing that he did mm. um, with that. You know, with the with the handwritten. You know, uh, handwriting and everything. So, right. You know, that's all. Uh, you could almost say that's probably something like Yoko Ono would have done. You know, but uh, oh, good for him, uh, and I'm 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 glad, but. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think everybody's really getting excited about this about this pepper thing. I think you know the excitement is is just astounding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. But, I wonder, you know, going back to the record company Universal and Apple, you know, what would make them happy as far as sales? Do you need to sell ten thousand box sets to be happy, or you know, fifty thousand? And would that really? Would that tell them whether or not they're going to be doing future releases like this? Well, like you were saying, Steve, probably, or, or Alan, uh, not to this kind of, to, to, to a deluxe box set like this. Mm-hmm. But um, what are they looking for in terms of sales? What would make them happy? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, look at, look at what the Monkees have done. They've reissued all their albums with, you know, with double, uh, at least with double CDs and outtakes. So, I mean, 
and that's the monkeys. I, not that I'm, I'm not putting down the monkeys, folks, but I'm just saying the monkeys have done it and the Beatles have not. So mm-hmm. that, um, that, I mean, there's an example right there. And I mean, it's become pretty much standard for everybody now. So, but the and, fact that it's the Beatles, mm-hmm. they may expect a lot more in sales mm-hmm. because of who it is. Right. You know, the, the biggest band ever. So they don't want to embarrass themselves by having, you know, a, a box set that doesn't sell well. So I don't what, think would, that. what would really be, what would they be striving for? What would be the goal they're shooting for? How many copies? That That's something I'd like. To Good know. question. I, I think it's, it's uh, I think you can pretty well guarantee, though, that it's going to be at the top of the chart the week it's released. I think that's a guarantee. That's almost guaranteed. Given how how the pre-orders on Amazon were, I think that's that's a no-brainer. I think it'll definitely happen. So, but also you've got the deluxe box set, and you also have the the two CD set. Right, you have all the you have all the yeah you have all those yeah. different sets. But I think the one that's going to hit the most is going to be the, the deluxe, and I think that's going to really blow a lot of people away. Well, that so. really would be something because you're talking about something that now costs 119.99 on Amazon. Mm-hmm. For that to be a, a number one album would be beyond extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it was happen. it was number one in pre-sales for you know at least a couple of days after it was announced, mm-hmm. okay. and that's pretty damn good, you know, for that. So, yeah, I, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna do really well. I think it's gonna there's going to be a lot of people taking notice about this. So any other, any other thoughts or anything? Uh, I didn't know if you wanted to bring up the rock and roll hall of fame broadcast. I did not see it, but if you guys did, I, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but um, only uh, as in terms of what, what Beatle fans would mm-hmm. be interested in the most. I mean, we can all have very, very taste, but the fact that ELO finally got in, and that mm-hmm. Danny Harrison did an amazing introduction and induction speech mm-hmm. for ELO. It was it, it just it, it was really powerful, yeah. and he looked pretty comfortable up there on stage too, talking mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. Jeff Lynne and you know how much uh, you know he idolized him. And uh, the very first concert he ever went to was an ELO concert where George went up on stage and played "Roll Over Beethoven." Right. Oh wow! ELO. Oh my! So yeah. I should mention I just came off of vacation. Uh, I was in Southern California for a week, and it was pretty much a non-Beatle vacation. However, we had the one of the last night. It was the last night we were there, we went to see Beauty and the Beast. And outside the theater, they were doing a promotion for Guardians of the Galaxy Two. They were playing all the songs on the soundtrack and blasting as we were coming into the area was Mr. Blue Sky. It's on the CD, mm. which was and that was very cool to hear it. Uh, I mean, there were people dancing and everything, and and it, it was kind of interesting that you know a lot of them were young people that probably weren't all that familiar with ELO, but they were listening. But you heard Mr. Blue Sky, and it was it was uh, pretty nice. So. Mm. Yeah, well, in fact, um, ELO performed Mr. Blue Sky at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Awards. It sounded mm-hmm. great. Did, did it sound great? Oh yeah. yeah. They did uh, Evil Woman also, and they, they opened the show with Roll Over Beethoven as a tribute to Chuck Berry, who had just died. Mm. So that was really classy, you know, the way that it whole, the whole thing started. Right. That's interesting, because so. they normally would have done that at the end. Because hmm. that's the way they usually close their concerts, you know, back in the 70s, is they closed it with Roll Over Beethoven. And that was one of the – that was one of the – you know, best versions of that song. It was so distinctive back then. Uh, you know, I remember hearing that, you know, and just <laughs> thinking it was just wonderful because it really was. They did a great job with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Alan, your thoughts about the Hall of Fame? You watched the broadcast. Right? Um, I didn't see the broadcast. I um, listened to a clip of uh, Danny Harrison's introduction and uh, and also you know read the text of it and uh, and you know I agree it was it was a great intro and um, it it also I think gave us a little bit of a glimpse into you know. George and Danny's home life a bit, you know, I mean, mm. we knew that George and Jeff Lynn were really tight, but, you know, hearing, hearing Danny describe the friendship and describe, you know, how it appeared to him as a little kid and as he grew up and, uh, you know, and grew sort of close to, to Jeff and 
that way. It uh, it, it it just was. Uh, I thought it was very moving, really. Mm. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, and I I like ELO. A lot of people, I don't know, a lot of people really dislike them, but I've always. I've always been a fan of theirs, so I'm glad that they finally got in. I think it was overdue. You know, as we've we've all heard that quote from John Lennon saying, "If the Beatles were still together now, we would be doing what ELO's doing," you know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or something to that effect. Um, right. You know, and you can see that. I mean, you could see Beatles influence all over ELO. It's there's no question right. about that. Uh, right. I am the Walrus era Beatles, really. Oh yeah, I mean, I, other than that, I, I I didn't see the rest of the show, so I'll catch up with it at some point. I hope. But, yeah. yeah. Also, you know, I I read the text of what Danny had said, and usually every time you see these broadcasts, everything is so edited down. Yeah. But what Danny had to say, I think almost everything was included in there, mm-hmm. and what was really touching was that the very end he talked about the fact that he worked on Brainwashed with Jeff Lynn without mentioning the title of the album, but he was referring to that mm-hmm. and just saying what an honor it was, you know, to work on that album, to, to take all these songs that George had left behind and, and really mold them into, you know, something really beautiful, which he did with Jeff Lynn's guidance. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just a great speech from Danny. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, all, and also, uh, you mentioned overdue. I watched this show in its entirety, the HBO broadcast, and I'm just – say what you will about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's a lot of politics. There's so many artists who deserve to be in there that are still not in there. But this particular show had so many artists that deserved it that were long overdue. Mm-hmm. I mean you look at Joan Baez. My God. <laughs> how, long, how far back does she go? Right. And uh, thank God Yes is finally in there. And they actually – performed with John Anderson and and, uh, Steve Howe was there and uh, Alan White, Trevor Rabin. It sounded great. You know, I I was happy for, you know, all the artists that made it into the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I am too. I would would have, I will say, um, and uh, it's a guilty pleasure, I suppose, but I would have loved to have seen Steve Perry perform with Journey, but that's my, that's me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. You know, I, I, and not only that, but Steve was so happy to be there. Right. <laughs> you saw him on stage. He, he couldn't have been happier. He was so proud of Journey and talking about, you know, it was the, the biggest break of his career. And who wouldn't have wanted to have been in a band like that? And yet he didn't, he didn't perform. Him. Yeah. I don't, I don't know the full reason why. So I'm not sure he does either. Because from what I've been, I mean, the whole, the whole history of the band is just very strange. But. Oh well, and then, and then Greg Raleigh. Hey, Greg Raleigh got represented. <laughs> right. A Ringo All Star is now right. two times in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with right. Santana and with Journey. So good right. for Greg. Yeah, yeah, good for Greg. Good for Greg. Mm. So uh, and Ken says that he went to see Julian Lennon at uh, one of his bookstore appearances. Is that right, Ken? Yeah, he was at the Barnes and Noble in Union Square in New York City a few weeks ago, and he did a Q and A with Dennis Elsis. Good old, our good friend Dennis Elsus. Yeah, Dennis, who also, by the way, was at the playback session for Sgt. Pepper. Okay. So, um, yeah, and it was all talking about uh, the new book, which is called Touch the Earth. It's a children's book, which uh, is all about the environment and how to protect the environment and how important clean air and clean water is. And he's always been involved with environmental causes. And uh, part of the proceeds of the book go to benefit the White Feather Foundation, which he started, based on the name. The name came from what John had said to him, that to let him know that he's okay and the world would be okay after he passed away, Julian would see it in the form of a white feather, Mm. which he was handed by a a tribe in Australia while he was in tour there uh, in the early 90s. So he named the, the foundation the White Feather Foundation. And uh, he's done a lot of work to benefit that that uh, organization. Right. And um, it was a really good Q and A. Most of the questions that Julian's been asked have been the same. If you've if you've looked online and watched all the TV appearances that he's made, he's been on The View. He's been on Tavis Smiley. Um, he was on CBS's 22 Minutes, which is really a very good interview that I would recommend everyone to watch. Because most of the interviews are fairly short, and he says pretty much the same thing in all of it. 
But uh, one of the things that I found interesting, which I think he said in another interview, it was the first time I ever heard it, was that um, he and Sean have been talking about working together. Whoa. And um, there's no exact date being planned for this, but they've talked about either doing uh, some covers of songs, not Beatles songs, though. He pointed that out because thank God you can't you can't uh, you can't do songs you can't try to cover songs that are already perfect. Right, that's the, what he had said. But he hasn't done all that much musically since his last album. Everything changes, and he's been very much involved with photography. And now this book, which is actually going to be a trilogy, there's going to be two more books that follow. But, um, yeah, it's the first time I ever heard him talk about working with Sean, which is something I've always wanted him to do. I've never been one of those people who want all the Beatles sons to reunite and, you know, and form a band together. But Julian and Sean, you know, they're brothers. (laughs) They like each other. Yeah, I I hate that whole, you know, Beatles sons uniting thing. But that would be an interesting, depending on which way they took their music, I mean, the melding of, of their music would be could be quite um intriguing um depending on what they do it would be that would be very interesting very interesting well they're both very good melodic songwriters right so if they wrote anything together that would that i i would be very curious to find out i'll bet you it'd be really strong and he also brought up the fact that you know there is that thing with vocals when you've got a family with vocals you've got that similarity in the voices yeah, mm-hmm. and he pointed out the Everly Brothers, and you know we can talk about the Beach Boys and the BTS and those groups, but there is that magical thing when you blend the vocals of brothers together or sisters together, and so from that point of view, he found it intriguing. So he said that they are talking about it, but there are no nothing definite has been planned yet. We can hope. <laughs> yeah, that that would be that would be very interesting. Uh, I would like to see that. I would definitely like to see them do something. It'd be even nicer. I don't know that at this point she would be involved, but even but even if Yoko added a little something to it, that would be that would be really interesting. That would be uh, that would be nice. I, I'd like to see that, but we'll see what happens. We'll see. Yeah. Well. Gentlemen, I think we've come to the end of the discussion. If you want to get a hold of the show, you can write to us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We're on Facebook. You can get us there. We're on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. Um, you guys want to give a quick contact uh, information, um, Alan? Uh, sure. The easiest way to get me is on Facebook under either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And I'm also on Twitter at Cozen. Okay, um, Ken, give us your give us a quick uh, contact info. Okay, my email address is every little thing at att dot net. Uh, don't forget my website kenmichaelsradio dot com. I just want to plug two things here very quickly. On my website, I do give away concert tickets in the New England area, and there's someone very special that the two of you, I'm sure, would like to see. Lulu in concert. Really? Where? Yeah. I, didn't know she was, I didn't know she was performing. Good. Yes, yeah, she's going to be at Daryl's house on May the 28th in mm-hmm. Pauling, New York. And it's very rare when she comes to the U.S. to perform. Wow. Are, so, you going, um, are you going to that? I'm going to that show, sure. Wow. And um, I have three pairs of tickets to give away, and it's very easy to win. Just go to the ticket giveaways page on my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. Also, you know that we've had Charles Rosnay on this show a few mm-hmm. times to talk about something that he's been doing almost every single year in the summertime called Danbury Fields Forever. Well, right. he's doing it again, and it's actually been moved to a different location. It's no longer in Danbury, so it's not called Danbury Fields Forever. It's called the Fab Four Festival, and it's being held in Wallingford, Connecticut at the Oakdale Theater, which is a very familiar theater for people who live in the area. And it's being held on June the 10th. And I'm going to be either the MC or one of the MCs for the show. And you get to see bands from all over New England perform, all Beatles tribute bands. And it's a whole day affair. And it's a lot of fun. And it's actually two stages. There's going to be one indoors and one outdoors. The outdoors one, I think, is all acoustic. But if you live in the New England area, you want a whole day of Beatle music, come by and see the Fab Four Music Festival. 
which again is June 10th at the Oakdale Theater in Wallingford, Connecticut. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay. All right. I think that kicks our our business. I think we're I think we're about through. Um, thank you all for listening. On behalf of uh, myself, Steve Marinucci, uh, Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen, and Al Sussman, who is not with us today, we'd like to say thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.